Welcome to Belmont Poetry Night. I'm Monica Cordy, your host and the Poet Laureate of Belmont, California. We meet on the third Tuesdays of every month to celebrate the spoken word as makers, listeners and admirers of poetry. We come with featured guests and an open mic, inviting readers of all ages. After gathering for several years at our favorite physical venue, the Belmont Library, since the pandemic, our thriving poetry circle has transitioned to this virtual space, and I am grateful it allows me to welcome listeners and poets from across the globe. So good to see you all. Uh, there is so much uh, possibility and promise where poets are around, and I feel truly inspired to see this Zoom room filled with poetry enthusiasts from different places and spaces each month. And I see we almost have 43 folks in the house tonight, so what fantastic turnout. Uh, as per our Poetry Night tradition, I'd love to know where you are joining me from, so please feel free to share in the chat. Uh, thank you all once again for being here and zooming in. Moving on, uh, tonight we gather to celebrate the arts the heartbeat of human expression. And we all know that through poetry, music, painting, and dance, uh, the arts offer us refuge, uh, reflection, and a feeling of renewal. Uh, they remind us of beauty in the mundane, courage in vulnerability, and connection in shared stories. And that's why I bring this poetry night to you in the theme, Gratitude for the arts. As this year draws to a close, I feel immense gratitude for the journey I've shared with you in curating these poetry nights, uh, bringing my creative vision to life and turning ideas into meaningful experiences. And this past year has been uh, very busy but fulfilling, uh, letting me put uh, all the creative endeavors into practice organizing events that celebrated the power of poetry and the arts uh, and the brilliance of voices from all ages and experiences. So for me, this evening is a tribute not only to the creative spirit, but also to the community we have built together, uh, a circle of storytellers, dreamers, makers, and of course, listeners who find joy and meaning in the beauty of uh, the arts. So uh, I have a pen here, so maybe I'll raise my pen to all of them and say that here's to the artists, to gratitude and to the journey ahead. Thank you so much for raising that pen along with me. I really appreciate it. I'd like to open uh, this reading with a delicately crafted poem by Barbara Kruker, an award-winning poet from Pennsylvania. Uh, the title of this poem, All That Is Glorious Around Us, comes from an exhibit on the Hudson River School. All that is glorious around us is not for me. These grand vistas, sublime peaks, mist field overlooks, towering clouds, but doing errands on a day of driving rain staying dry inside the silver skin of the car, 160,000 miles, still running just fine. Or later, sitting in a cafe warmed up by the steam from white chicken chili, two cups of dark coffee, watching the red and gold leaves race down the street, confetti from autumn's bright parade. And I think of how my mother struggles to breathe, how few good days she has now, how we never think about the glories of breath, oxygen cascading down our throats to the lungs, simple as the journey of water over rock. It is the nature of stone to be satisfied, writes Mary Oliver. It is the nature of water to want to be somewhere else, rushing down a rocky tor or high escarpment, the panoramic landscape boundless behind it. 
But everything glorious is around us already. Black and blue graffiti shining in the rain's bright glaze. The small rainbows of oil on the pavement, where the last car to park has left its mark on the glistening street. This radiant world. Thank you. I feel that uh, while listening to this poem, uh, one must appreciate the craftsmanship of it, how subtle shifts in the lines unfold, uh, beginning with a clear separation from the title and then masterfully circling back to it at the end. All that is glorious around us. The movement in the poem creates a beautiful, seamless unity, and Kruger never ceases to remind us of the profound wonder of simply being alive and the countless opportunities we have to show our gratitude for this extraordinary gift, even if uh, the times are most difficult and dark. Uh, through her words, we are invited to embrace life's essence and celebrate it in every possible way. And as our evening progresses, one thing I can tell you for certain is that you will be held in this embrace much longer tonight through poems and conversation as you listen to our feature, Esther Kamkar. I've known Esther for quite some time now and have had the pleasure of hearing her read before, but uh, it is only now after chatting with her more about her work that I truly uh, am discovering the profound depth and resonance of her poetry and her lifelong passion for the arts and i love and i hope that uh, uh, you will feel the same way at the end of this reading uh, and i'm really thrilled to have you esther as my featured artist tonight and let me introduce all of you to her esther kamkar was born in tehran iran and lived in jerusalem for seven years before emigrating to the united states she has been a poet and artist for most of her life. She has lived in Palo Alto, California for many years and published three books of poetry through her own imprint, Zeba Press. Her poems have also appeared in anthologies and literary journals in the United States and abroad. To discover more about Esther, uh, we definitely have tonight, but also you can explore her website, estherkamkar.com. I'll be sharing that in the chat as well. On that note, uh, the mic is all yours, Esther. A warm welcome to you. Uh, you're still not unmuted, uh, Esther. Can't okay. hear you. There you go. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Monica, and, and good evening to everybody. <laughs> I just would like to start the reading. I like to remember my friend or our friend, Peter Carroll. He was the poet of Belmont or perhaps the poet of the world. And uh, tonight I will put him behind my left ear so he is here to listen to me too. Uh, Monica asked me to read a poem in Persian. So I would start reading a poem by Rumi in Persian and then its interpretation, if not translation, by Coleman Barks. And Rumi's, Rumi said, sell your cleverness and buy bewilderment. So, and his Quatrain is here. Gofti ke biav ke bag khandid o bahar sham ast o sharab o shahedan e cho negar anja ke to nisti az in ham che tu banja ke to hasti khud az in ha be che kar Come to the orchard in spring there is light and wine and sweethearts in the pomegranate flowers. If you do not come, these do not matter. If you do come, these do not matter. So this is our Rumi. <clears throat> so 
So my first poem tonight is titled On Language, number 11. In my mother tongue, a child is not born. A child comes to the world. A child comes to the world to a mother's nipples, butterflies, water. In my mother tongue, we don't say I was thinking of you but you fell into my heart. We start the pairings with the female, mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, aunts and uncles. Nurseries of girls and boys have been falling into my heart. How to love every child in the world as if it were a walk on the moon, but but geraniums and salt, how to love every child in the world, not as if it were a walk on the moon, but geranium and salt. This next poem is, is titled Undocumented, and it was inspired by a, um, a textile work by Consuelo Jimenez Underwood undocumented border flowers, undocumented. Come over here, I have something to show you. The indigenous border crossers, oblivious to guards and checkpoints, blanket the fields. Heliotropo smells like vanilla, sagebrush is silvery green artemisa. The red of cototillos, not the same as the red of fairy dusters, zapotillos, in harmony with yellow creosote flowers and orange desert mallow. What difference does a wall make? Sun cup's only story is the story of yellow. Beautiful poems there, Esther. Thank you. I really loved, uh, thank you so much for opening with Rumi's poetry. Uh, it's so timeless and I always find myself uh, going back to his verses and feeling so nourished uh, when I'm listening to them. I really uh, enjoyed your reading of it and uh, I, I think you really transported us to a world of his making by reading in both languages, uh, Persian and English. And uh, it was such a luminous piece. And even the pieces that followed it, uh, how tenderly you have woven those lines where you say how to love a child in the war, as if uh, the, the rock on the moon. And uh, the next poem that you read was undocumented. And if I can just uh, take a a second to show everyone the painting that you, that it was based off on. Um, I'll just take a second. Uh, I had pulled it up so it should be visible to everyone. Right there. All of you can see that and the cockatiels that you heard in the poem, they are right there. It's such a beautiful work of art. Uh, and thank you, Esther, for reading that piece as well and bringing so much uh, of it into, into words, what we can see and visualize. Thank you. I'll stop sharing here, but I have a question for you, uh, Esther. Um, I think there are uh, so many um, poets who will agree with this. Uh, I was uh, reading an interview and uh, one of them had... Uh, something that uh, one poet and multimedia visual artist, Mathea Harvey, said that uh, so many of, uh, of, our, of the poets are inter interdisciplinary artists uh, because being a poet is about attentiveness and that attentiveness doesn't only translate into words. And as a multidisciplinary artist yourself, uh, in one of your interviews, I had heard you say, and I, I will quote this, 
is that my instruments are my pen, my brush, my spoon, and my trowel. So I moved from the kitchen table to the art table to the garden. And this beautifully encapsulates a seamless blending of creativity and life. And my question for you is, art often serves both as a refuge and a revelation. In what sense uh, and at what, in what ways has engaging with the arts and poetry uh, deepened your sense of gratitude uh, for its role in your personal and creative growth? Hmm. Um, this reminds me of a poem that Adam Zagajewski wrote and he left us with this recipe, try to praise the mutilated world. So it's kind of relates to the first poem that you read. I think mm -hmm. it's just, it's a state of being, state of being, writing or cooking or, or, or making art. Uh, and it brings us to a direct experience of unity with everything, basically, and and make makes us realize the vastness of of universe and how everything listens to everything else. Mm, beautifully put. I love yeah. that. That's so amazing. And when you when you're uh, working on these things uh, and going from one thing to another, all of them leading to creation in some way. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, about uh, gratitude? Are you are you thinking of that intentionally, or does it come to you later? I, I doesn't. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't think it comes or it doesn't come. It's just mm -hmm. part of us. Is is basically part. It's like love. Yeah. We don't have to look for it. We don't have to seek it. We don't have to give it. It's just part of us, the way we listen to everything on everybody. And and that's part of it. the way you care for people is also gratitude. You know, caring for ourselves is like take, taking care of other people. So everything is so connected. It's not just one thing here and the other category there. I feel like makes us connect we are connected sometimes we forget that we think we are strangers we are refugees we are immigrants but i've decided to be a host i'm hosting now yeah so that's kind of woven in the poems or is in is under the poem is in the archaeology of the poem absolutely yeah i hear you yeah gratitude is in the archaeology of of who we yeah. are and what we are doing in that moment. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, Esther. Uh, please, if you'd like to continue reading a yeah. couple more poems and then we'll go back to the questions. Okay. This is a poem, it's titled Chickadee Brain. It's, it's very seasonal. <laughs> chickadee Brain. My chickadee brain expands in fall hippocampus grows to remember what I hoard and where I store food for winter's long nights. My encosticos I keep in a paint box, Egyptian violet, Hansa yellow beeswax to illuminate the windowless rooms of the heart in winter to burn in and fuse the heat of the sun. Summer tomatoes I stack in the freezer's hungry belly. They do not move my ruby stones. They wait for soup. Precious apricot and plum jewels in glass jars I hide in the hollow limb of a carob tree. Indigo appetites, I pick their leaves in fallow fields and feed them honey and dates for nine months of fermentation to be born blue in winter air. And this poem, it's, I'm reading for Monica. She asked me to read this. <laughs> I am a miniaturist. 
eye to eye, eye to eye. How long does it take to be at peace with living framed in my own locket to see small, make and love small things, a moment, an instant, running hands through hair time, bread dough rising time, how long? Men scratches on the heart, stitch mirror sequins on baby hats, count tiny madrone bellflowers, and take home the peeling bark to boil, write alphabets on bay leaves, and love letters on postcards, Make an owl that fits on a thumb and collect jacaranda seeds and seashells. Enter narrow back doors to kitchens. Draw faces the size of postage stamps with tiny circles and dashes, revealing and concealing again. Their weight has nothing to do with scale. Thanks, Esther, for especially making sure you read that piece. I really love it. it it's available to read again or uh, revisit again on Esther's website. And uh, I really love that piece for the questions, the, the bunch of questions that it comes up with. And uh, it's so relatable in, in those little things that you say, Esther. I really love that. And on your website, talking about it, uh, writing, uh, I, I remember you have... Uh, a note which says, uh, writing my bio is a hard thing to do. And the short version is what was is over with and what is the poems and other works will tell us. And I really yeah. loved that. <laughs> how you, how especially how you put it. Uh, and my question to you in relation to that was, how does a poet serve as a conduit between the past and the present? Uh, crafting poems and works that not only bear witness to what was, but also guide us in understanding and shaping what is. And I think you can definitely uh, give us a great answer on that. <laughs> well, <laughs> my first answer is I'm not sure. <laughs> my second one is I think the mysterious is always on our side. Hmm. And um, and I try to collaborate with my vulnerability. I think vulnerability is a door to something bigger, maybe the truth in myself, or maybe even to love of everything. Mm -hmm. So, and uncertainty is a certain thing, and the unknowing that goes into creation is another part of it. You know, and uh, yeah, it's, um, I don't think we know exactly what's going on when you, when you write about your past and now and the future, I'm not sure. It just happens. Um, yes, and, and everything also changes, you know, it's um, all things fall under the law of change. So what I, mm. I may say today, it may not be the same tomorrow. So I just surrender to be uncertain and be vulnerable and be brave and uh, be fearless. I think vulnerability brings us to fearlessness in writing mm. or in creating art. But mostly, I don't know. <laughs> Just, no absolutely they, these are such uh, pearls of wisdom or such great takeaways Esther uh, I love uh, what you said about collaborating with your vulnerability uh, I see in the chat Lee Rossi says I try to collaborate with, with my vulnerability how hard is that <laughs> I, think, I think we have to enter the wilderness joyfully hmm And writing poems is really a joyful practice. It is, yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. At, at certain points, it is a very joyful practice. But then when you're entering certain poems, which 
uh, which uh, where you're reflecting on darker times or difficult times, I think that you are reaching uh, reaching another level of vulnerability, which is which is hard to get to at times. Yes, but it's not it's not this or that. It's joyful and mm. it's it's horrible the hunger or the ignorance of the world or 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 bombs or children dying is that, but it's also mm. joy. The joy there is your grand grandchildren smiles mm. and this the leaves falling off the trees, you know, is all there, it's not separate. And we have to have our hearts open to receive everything. We can just be choosy. Say, I want this part. I don't want the other part. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> Absolutely. I hear you, Esther. And uh, in all that you said, I feel uh, so um, good and uh, and really content in, in this thought that uh, I made the best choice when I was thinking of this theme for the poetry night. And you came to my night uh, to my mind as as the featured poet for tonight. So I'm really happy that you are here and sharing these thoughts with us, Esther. Yeah. Uh, if, if I may read another poem, some time Absolutely. ago, I made, I made fabric books. They were four pages mm -hmm. and I did some mark making, not with pen or brush, but with stitches. Perfect. Uh, and then I buried them under my carob tree for 40 days. It was raining and there were storms and I just wanted to see how Mother Earth speaks to my books. Mm -hmm. So after 40 days, I dug them up and I wrote this poem before I did my practice of bearing books. So this, I was imagining what would happen to my books. This, <clears throat> this is after I'm digging them up. Unearthing practice. She digs up the book, the book buried under the carob tree in her garden for 40 days. The simple fabric book with uneven edges fits in her hand. Hemp pages, only four, fray that the edges are wet and soiled. She submerges the book in a rain puddle, washes off the dirt, spreads open the book, under the sun. The muted colors, the tiny holes, the work of some hungry creatures and the stains have added subtlety to the running seed and couching stitches marking the pages. Her book vulnerable to the effects of weathering recorded the sun, earth, rain, and the energy of the nibbling critters in the language of stains, discoloration, and shrinkage of fibers. Her modest book in its simplicity does not recognize material hierarchy. She marvels at the worn and stained book in its give and take with the earth in its hurried decay. She loves its vulnerability, its beauty. This next poem is titled, An Older Woman in the Locker Room. Far from the cavernous Turkish bath in Jerusalem, the lounging room for drinking cool drinks, combing hair, massaging shoulders, this locker room with its narrow lockers, crowded corners and hurrying women is the clumping of muscles competing for space. I open my locker, there are four women, there are three or four women rush to their numbers near mine squeeze in the narrow space around the bench in our section, ephemeral bodies. I tell a young woman, you go first, I'll wait for you to finish. You are like my daughter. Before I move, she starts to cry. Each body has been loved at least by a mother. Talk of the PTA, 
new jobs, nursing homes, surgery, medication, injury, smell of lotion and hairspray, and roar of hair dryers fill the space. No one smiles. I believe in the law of impermanence. I wish the younger woman good knees under their Lululemon pants for at least 50 more years. All the fresh folded towels and the hundreds of Q-tips in the glass ball won't save us. Uh, about this particular piece, Esther, uh, I have seen it on paper, so I see that uh, it has a very crisp structure structure to the piece, uh, yes. just like a, it looks like a door or a, a, a window uh, where the text is filled in. So clearly you, you visualize your poem uh, on the page, how it should look and how it should, it should be viewed by the yes. reader, uh, and that's <laughs> definitely a sign of an artist. Yeah, we see it's it right a, there. It's a locker room. It's the a locker room. room. The locker room. <laughs> ah, perfect. Yeah. So I was yeah very close to it. A locker room. And uh, uh, if we can take a moment, Esther, here uh, to to take a look at some of your artwork because I see this art happening even when you're using words and you're putting it on paper. Uh, and from one of your poems, I was listening to. In fact, there's a line that stuck with me. Uh, not the poems tonight, but uh, so, sometime that I've heard them before. Uh, and the line goes, but what of grief? Can the paper creases bear the weight? Can you collage mourning? Yes. And I really love those lines. And uh, I really see that art has a way of transforming lives and offering solace and inspiration and purpose. And at this point, I think it would be perfect to introduce some of your art, uh, if you'd like that, I can pull it up. Sure. Thank you. Uh, let's see. There it is. Just put it in the slideshow. Can all of all of you view it? Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. Let's move to the first slide where it's one of your stitched artist books that I see, and this is the one you were talking about, Esther, in your poem as well? Yes, yes. And you created something similar and buried it uh, to see what happens? Yes. If, you, if you'd like to give us a peek into uh, how this comes to you or how do you work with some, some, some ideas like these, that would be great. Uh, well, um, I also learn from other people, other teachers or other people that I... I encounter is not all my original ideas, but I have mm -hmm. my own interpretation and my own take and, uh, and my own marks. Uh, like in this one, in the purple one, I just, uh, I see where the needle takes me. I don't have any plans. I just take the needle. It's like very meditative uh, practice. Um, I just take the needle and some string and pieces of cloth and I bind them together and I start stitching, listen to music or listen to a podcast or I'm quiet by myself. I think quiet, being quiet and solitude is very essential. Um, for I, when my children were small, they would say, we want to watch TV, we are bored. I say, if you can <laughs> read and write and count, you won't be bored. So I feel like I can stitch, I can paint, I can, <laughs> so I'm never bored. This is a <laughs> blessing. So and that's amazing. <laughs> so that's how these books work. I just, um, I see where the needle takes me and I go with it, you know. I love that. Yeah. And th these are so unique. I really love the idea and, uh, and what you're doing with them. Uh, the, the pattern that evolves out of it, it's really unique. Uh, let's take a look at some of the other artworks that you have. I love how diverse they are and uh, so different from each other. The artist book, I believe it's it's painted with watercolors, are they? Yes, yes. And then we have the tulip paintings, which are oil or acry acrylic? They're acrylic. 
Yeah, and, uh, and the male art, I'm a member of the International Union of Male Artists, and we send postcards, you know, works of art, six inch by four inch postcards to each other uh, around the world. And mm -hmm. I send one and I get back in, in um, how do you say, I send them and they send me. <laughs> in exchange, in exchange, in yeah. Exchange, in exchange, yes. <laughs> that's and fascinating we don't, we don't have a we don't have a gallery no museum no no agent the the agent is the male man or the male woman and the fee is one postage stamp and, wow. and this, this practice was wonderful during the pandemic i sent out three four postcards every week wow uh, that's a lot do, do you keep account of how many you have received I, so far I, I have a collection, but I used to to scan everything I sent out, but it became too cumbersome. I just send, <laughs> right. them, send them to the universe. Sometimes the universe <laughs> answers and sometimes it doesn't. And it's okay. Maybe somebody found it and is enjoying to look at it. I, I, I really don't. I'm not invested in, yeah. in the result. It's fine. You know, if it's absolutely. Lost, yes. I love uh, that. And I also see your collage art on the book cover of one of your books. Yes, that one is a is a collage of every strip of the book is a page from, uh, it's an altered um, um, National Geographic pages that you, you ah. add some chemical to and the pigment moves around and each strip is from one page. And I just put it together, and uh, and um, and I decided to put it for the cover of this last. Yeah, book. it it does look very appealing, and I believe Robert Perry, who's in the house tonight, uh, helped you with the design and putting the book together. Yes, he is a book designer, a wonderful book designer, and these are layers, layers like in right. my own layers of memory, layers of life, layers of. Um, anything that comes our way so yeah. that's very cool Esther and I have one more slide to show where we have your gelatin prints uh, please talk a little bit about this as well okay this gelatin prints is when you don't have a printing press and you want to do mono prints you mm -hmm. can use a gelatin plate is 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 basically jello that is harder you can eat it but it's hard <laughs> is the texture of your flesh and you put your pigment on the gelatin plate and you put the paper and you left, lift the print mm. and then you lift again the ghost of the print and it's very economical it can, you can do it on in your uh, on your kitchen table on your dining table it's really easy to do um, and it's wonderful you never know what you get you can predict what you get Right, right. I can see that. Yeah, the the uh, free uh, release of the colors there. But are these the same prints where you had talked about uh, using pomegranate skin or coffee, uh, where no, you use all these colors? No, those no no those things. So those natural dyes I make boiling purple cabbage makes blue beautiful blue on paper, and boiling pomegranate skin is a pink. Uh, solution but on paper it becomes this gorgeous green it's like magic those I use for uh, making books handmade books and I stitch uh -huh. them um, yes and the other thing I love is making rust water with uh, with uh, steel wool from the kitchen mm -hmm. I make rust water as soon as you put it on paper and you add hydrogen peroxide it becomes this wonderful rusty color, ochre color. Lovely. And, and I love that uh, from decay, from decay to a new life. Right. And that transformation is very evocative to me. So I love doing that. I it sounds rusty. beautiful, Esther. And uh, uh, if I'm if I may to to piggyback off uh, one of my earlier questions. Uh, in a, in more generalized terms, uh, how has your own poetry writing overlapped with uh, your art, uh, your or your art projects that we see here? And does art making 
uh, feed your poetry or keep you from it? How is it? I think they're one and the same. It's like, you know, they, they are connected and they're one and the same. They don't impede one another. They come mm. from the same heart. So they have no problem with each other. You know, they coexist. And Perfect. I think coexist with them. I thought the writing or making art saved my life. But I think my life saved my life. <laughs> It oh, wasn't that's a, that's a very deep thought. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if it's deep or not, but I think, yeah, my life saved my life. So, yes, yes, that's the only thing I can say. True, and I remember you you had also said somewhere that uh, we live so many lives and there are a multitude of roles that we play. So it's amazing that we you bring in all your lived experiences in all the things that you do. Yes, sometimes somebody asks me, how long did it take you to write this book of such things, the one that you showed the cover? Right. I said, it, it took me 74 years to write this book. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, because you bring all of yourself, all of yourself along, your baggage, good baggage and bad baggage, the, the wounds, the suffering, the joys, the, the everything with you. So it took me that long to write this book. So, yes. True. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing all of that, uh, Esther. I'll close our presentation for now. And uh, maybe uh, you can take us through a few more poems uh, okay. Thank you. as we go further. Okay. This, this poem is called Rituals of Care mm -hmm. and was inspired by some installation at the De Young Museum. The artist is a Taiwanese American. His name is Li Mingwei. So it's a trio, rituals of care, mending, bending over the cloth, as in bending over the page to write. I start with blindness, wait a breath to search through my limited vocabulary of stitches to move the threaded needle in, out, around, through a loop with each breath. A small, simple tool and bewildering tenderness. Between this and that of my life, I want to remember the ordinary in the evening softening of the hot day, the way he was kneeling before me to trim a loose thread hanging from my shawl. Letter writing. At the museum gallery, I take off my shoes to step up to a lit enclosure, sit at a small desk where crisp white papers, envelopes, and sharpened pencils pull me in to start writing. You are no longer at the address I have not memorized by heart. Nevertheless, I write you a letter to tell you the jade clipping from your garden I smuggled back home is four feet tall, that it was impossible to accept your invitation for setting up a tent in the South Pole. I leave the letter in an unsealed envelope on the display wall for others to read. Between here and the, between here and here, the mass of loss, yet the imprint of a fern fiddlehead is there. Hosting. I don't know anything about these two brothers sitting barefoot against a collapsed wall on a broken cinder block, surrounded by splintered wood, jagged shards of glass, and clumps of dirt. The older boy's arms around his little brother sitting on his lap, their eyes open. I say, Come over here, I have something to show you. I'm painting you a house and a garden with a swing. 
palm and olive trees and wet grass for you to walk on barefoot. A table in the gazebo set with za'atar bread and fatouche and pitchers of water. L laughing doves on the trees, sunbirds on the roof. With tender brush strokes, I want to paint what they saw and felt and loved and lost. Thank you, Esther, uh, for sharing that piece as well. And and I see, I hear that three pieces are woven in that one single, the ritual to care, right? The rituals of care, yes. Rituals of care, All right. Beautiful lines in there. And uh, I think um, you haven't read this piece yet, uh, Question as Shelter, which I yes. really love. So may I read it now? Would you? Yeah, please read it now and then uh, uh, may, I'll have my last question for you. Okay. Question as shelter. Astronomers say when clouds bump into each other, they make a sound like chiming. Not all light and chiming on this rocky little planet, but also dark and limelight, tenderness and regret bird call and bombs. Some talk about suchness of things or thusness, but I like the most James Joyce's whatness. He said, hoarseness is the whatness of all horse. How to be consoled with a tree older than the forest, how to dwell in the uncertainty of the dark mysterious, the shelter of a question. How to press our heart against the great broken heart of the world without understanding, without turning away. Wow, such stunning lines there. How to press our heart against the great broken heart of uh, our great broken heart of the world without understanding, without turning away. I love the the profound uh, thought going in there. And uh, my final question to you, Esther, is uh, reaching a place of gratitude often requires a journey through reflection, uh, through awareness and even hardship. And uh, I see that your poetry often in dialogue with art, delves deeply into themes of migration, uh, belonging, identity, uh, uprooting. Uh, there are so many poems that are also about social injustices, war, pain, and suffering. And all of these are balancing an outward gaze with an inward exploration. How do you see the arts as a vehicle for fostering gratitude in others? whether through your creation, through engagement, or simply bearing witness? Yeah. Well, a very complex question, but I try to be um, honest <laughs> and without pretensions. I think for me, the only way I can see the way I relate to other people, I share my poems. I give people my books. I give them postcards. I send poems out and sometimes um, I receive responses and sometimes I don't. I think the only way is to walk out of our heart to meet other people's hearts. That's the only way and I hope if they hear me and they listen to my reading, they go home with a deep deeper understanding and connection to themselves, not to me, not to my work, but to themselves, each one of them, how it, how it affects them, how is it evokes things in them. Mm -hmm. Because when, once I send my poem out, I'm published. I'm published out now in Belmont. And the poem is not mine. It belongs to all of you. I don't know, 45 of you. <laughs> it's not mine anymore. So, uh, so that's the thing to share and to 
uh, it's like an invitation. You know, this is my world. This is what I think, I feel, I love. I I share with you. Take it. Do something with it for you. I hope it deepens your understanding on or your your own own understanding of yourself, your own heart. There's nothing nothing more to this. I think. I love that uh, what you say, Esther. It also brings uh, this memory of uh, what my mother used to always say. She is a poet as well, and she feels the same way that once you uh, let the poem out in the world, it's not yours anymore. It's it's everyone else's. So uh, the way everybody interprets it in their own way and uh, the way they uh, they feel it within themselves. So I really love how you put it and your your understanding of it. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that, Esther. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, there, there are uh, 51 of us now uh, taking that poem in and, and holding that uh, all the poems that you've offered to us. And I think we have uh, room for one more poem. We have time for it uh, before we close the segment. So if you'd like to read one more, that will be wonderful. Okay. This is the poem I would close with. It's called, it's titled Despite. And it's inspired by Edward Glissant. He was a poet from Martinique. Despite, this is why we stay with poetry. At the bow, there is something we now share. In poetry, a murmur, a cloud, in an unknown territory that does not terrify. Something at the bow, an unknown territory, our cry of poetry, a murmur, our boats are open. There is something we share now, it does not terrify. Our boats are open and we sail them for everyone. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> what a radiant piece that was. Uh, Esther, thank you. Uh, thank you so much again. Really grateful for all that you do. And uh, such a gr glorious and profoundly enriching reading that was. Uh, your work as a poet and artist is, uh, I'll say, a true testament to the healing power of creativity and expression. And I wish you all the very best as you continue doing everything that you love to do. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'd like to give the audience a moment to share their thoughts and thanks uh, while I take time to share uh, the link to your website in the chat. Uh, if uh, anyone would like to speak, please feel free to unmute yourself now. Uh, Esther, I really like your discussion of your artwork and how you put it together and how you cohabit with it. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your reading. Thank you. And thank Esther, you, I also want... Oh, go ahead. I just said thank you, Esther. Oh, thank you. Terry. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Esther. This is Phil. I just wanted to say thank you as well. Also, being an artist, I understand that aspect of how they're not a separate thing, how sometimes maybe one feeds the other, sometimes one is the other. But I really appreciated your reading and I enjoyed seeing your artwork and hearing your take on sharing it with the world. I think it's a very important thing. I think we are all together and that's an important thing to keep in mind. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I would like to say that uh, uh, and the, I, I'm lucky in that I get to uh, work with Esther like every week. I get to hear her another Esther poem. And, you know, I'm continually amazed. But hearing so many of them all at once and seeing them together with the art, I I am struck with the kind of spiritual depth of uh, Esther's work. I mean, she's a very wise woman. And I, I think that we're all very lucky to have her as part of our community. Thank you, Lee. Esther, this is Uriela here. Um, just thank you so much. I don't know, your poems are like silk on the skin. It's just like um, 
how connected you are to your soul and to yourself. And one of the things I take away that I love is when you say, when you write poems and and you give it out into the world and then what what you want is, well, each one connects to it. How does it connect to each one? And how do we, mm. you said it much nicer than I say, but it was really beautiful. And thank you so much. It was just an honor and pleasure to be here. Thanks. Thank you. Good job, Mama. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Hello. Um, this is Leela. I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you, Esther. And also, I have known Esther for several years. But as it goes, uh, I get to know her more and more. And as she said tonight, she has opened her heart to her surroundings and that connection that she talks about all of us and everything that it exists in the universe. I have felt uh, whenever I see her and even when I don't see her. And I'm so lucky to know her for several years and I have always, always, always enjoyed uh, seeing her, communicating with her, reading the world and seeing her arts. And thank you so much, Belmont Poetry community, and thank you, Monica, for having this night happening. And thank you, Esther. I'm so lucky to know you as a good friend of mine. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Lila. Um, Esther, I also wanted to say something. Even though I'm overwhelmed and it's really hard to get my thoughts together, but um, this was truly a gift. This evening was very, very special. Um, I think that all of us have felt your message to give to others without asking to receive. Uh, it's clear. Um, not only are your poems so very beautiful, this is not a surprise, but even the discussion and and the way you explained your attitudes about how you create and what is important to you is a gift as well. And I can only say that I'm thrilled that we have a recording so that I can uh, listen again. And if there is anything you I missed, which would be a shame, I can just hear it again and enjoy it again. And thank you very, very much. Thank you, Myrna. I just wanted to check, uh, did Esther's, anyone in Esther's family wanted to say something more? I thought I, someone was unmuted. I wanted to say that, you know, if we're really, really lucky, we can say that we have amazing mother-in-laws and I am one of the lucky ones. Great job. We love you. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. <laughs> well, thanks everyone uh, tonight. And once again, Esther, uh, you really brought the thought of gratitude home. And all that everybody has said echoes through the room tonight. I'm so grateful. And it was a real pleasure and honor to host you and uh, hold this conversation with you tonight. I thank hope you. Uh, you two enjoyed this experience. Yes, yes. Thank you so much to you and everybody and to David from the library. Thank you, everybody. And I'll be listening to all of you read now. <laughs> Perfect. Yes, please enjoy uh, the rest of our evening. I'll call upon you at uh, the end of our open mic segment to offer us a closing poem. Uh, before we wrap up this segment, uh, I'd like to remind uh, everyone that December will be our usual holiday break. And I look forward to seeing you all again next year in 2025 with a fresh series of poetry offerings. And as we close uh, out this year, I want to express my heartfelt gratitude to all of the featured poets uh, who joined me both virtually and in person 
uh, to the open mic readers who have shared their voices from all corners of the world and uh, the beautiful artists who have collaborated and performed mm -hmm. at various events. And of course, gratitude uh, to the city and the library as well for their con continued partnership. Uh, I'd also like to remember poets uh, whom we have lost, but who continue to enrich our lives through the work they have left behind. And really being able to serve and connect with such a diverse and passionate community makes my work as uh, the Poet Laureate so incredibly fulfilling. So thank you all once again. Thank you so much. With that, we are going to stop recording this segment. Those of you who are in the Zoom room, please stay online for the open mic segment of the evening. To the YouTube audience, thanks for joining in and hope to see you in the new year for our 2025 Virtual Belmont Poetry Night series. Wishing everyone a peaceful and joyful holiday season. Good night. <laughs>